This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids. Join the league of families who are transforming family time into unforgettable Bitcoin learning experiences. With our Hoddle Up Bitcoin mining board game, you're not just playing. You're building bridges, creating memories, and unlocking the brilliance of the future one block at a time. Money and economics are just so important because when we're financially sound, we feel safe, we feel secure, we feel empowered, we feel like we have control and we have more freedom and autonomy. I see in my practice women who maybe are single and they just don't really focus on these kinds of things or women who are not in good partnerships, they get compromised or hobbled with not being knowledgeable about these things or they get stuck or they lose their own sense of power in the relationship. And so I think it really is important for women to look and to learn and to face these issues. Hey, everybody, welcome to Orange Hatter. My mission for the Orange Hatter podcast is that after tuning in and hearing about everyday women's stories and their path to Bitcoin, you think, hey, if Bitcoin made a difference for them, maybe it could do the same for me. I'm so glad you're here. And I know you're going to love today's episode. Welcome. Hello listeners, if you're a woman in the Bitcoin space looking for a transformative getaway, then today's feature is just for you. We've tailored an exclusive retreat designed for rejuvenation, connection, and empowerment specifically for women like you. Picture this, mornings that begin with yoga by the ocean, days filled with the awe-inspiring beauty of nature, and conversations with fellow Bitcoin enthusiasts that turn into lasting friendships. This retreat is not just a break from your routine. It's a leap forward for your spirit and career. But it's more than relaxation and networking. We're actively supporting local Bitcoin circular economies. Your participation means contributing to real world change, connecting you with the impact of Bitcoin beyond the screen. This is an opportunity to step away from the daily grind, to recharge and to return inspired. Whether you're deep into your Bitcoin journey or just starting, this retreat will offer you valuable insights, support, and a renewed sense of purpose. Ready to be part of this unique experience? Visit www.orangehatter.com forward slash Yucatan now to learn more and reserve your spot. Spaces are limited as we aim to create an intimate and impactful experience for each attendee. Don't miss this chance to recharge, connect, and contribute. Join us. Let's make this retreat a milestone in your Bitcoin journey. Thank you for tuning in, and here's to empowering your path in the world of Bitcoin. We can't wait to welcome you. Hi, Vivian. Welcome to Orange Hatter. Thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. <laughs> Let's start by talking a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I have my own private practice, and I see a pretty diverse client population, working with people with a variety of different issues, depression, anxiety. I try to use an integrative approach with people, like including healthy lifestyles into the interventions or the treatments that I do with them, having that nice mind, body balance and overall good health is the way that I tend to work with people. Cool. So let's dive right into Bitcoin. When did you first come across this weird thing called Bitcoin? Yeah. And I, I guess it was probably about 13 years ago. My husband has been actively involved in it for that amount of time in terms of just studying Bitcoin, investing, making connections in the community, like going to conferences and meetup groups and thinking about ways to promote it from a business perspective and supporting all those who are trying to bring it more mainstream. And I've just had this cursory understanding and involvement in it. I've been because I've been raising kids and I've just been developing my own business and anything to do with money is not my preference. I don't really it's not my go to I have a lot of anxiety about money. But I found it to be really interesting. I do listen to podcasts on occasions and I check the Bitcoin prices and I get excited when it goes up and sometimes read articles. And when I see that new businesses are open to accepting Bitcoin. I think that's really cool. And like seeing other countries adopting it. I have an interest in it, but I've been dipping my toe in it, maybe waiting a little bit, but not taking the full plunge yet. And, but it's something that I do find it's 
really interesting and really exciting. And just to see how the community has just grown and developed. And I think it's really cool. And I love the idea of your podcast and especially talking to women about their experiences with it. I think it's really awesome. Yeah. You mentioned that you feel anxious about money. I think that's something a lot of women probably share. Can you elaborate a little bit about that and maybe just look at it from your professional point of view? What might be the cause and how we should deal with that? Yeah, I know just personally for me, it's one, like I said, I, I, I'm not a numbers type of person. <laughs> like I don't, I don't really like looking at numbers, but I think just money, I, I don't think in, in growing up, I had a really good, I don't know, schooling about money. My mother would spend money very well and she, she would give you the shirt off of her back. And with my dad, he was much more I don't know. I guess I wouldn't really say he was conservative because he would buy things that he really liked. But there was always tension around money and finances, even though as a family, you know, my parents did fairly well. And I just feel like I just was never fully educated into saving or how to invest in money. And it's not really having any problems with money, but just it just a lot of anxiety around it. Both my husband and I have our own businesses. And during the Obama years, we pay our taxes, but we were like hit with like one year, like $6,000 extra we'd owe and then $8,000 extra we owed. And, and it was just very stressful. And you're like, okay, where is this coming from, I guess it must've been around the 2008 time, you know, where things were happening in the economy. And I think having also one's own business that you have to think about money and you have to learn about money and be careful with your money. (laughs) And you are more aware of when your money is being taken from you with taxes and things like that, where, for example, I have a lot of friends who work for big companies or they work for the government and they don't, I don't think that they, at least in my experience, have the same worries or anxieties that I do. There's always feels like there's much more of a safety net. And when you have your own business, you don't have that when you have to just be, you see the flow of things coming in and going out. And so you do have to be much more aware and mindful about money. And yeah, I definitely feel the stress of it. And I definitely see it in the work that I do with my clients where, and I think it's something that's not really talked about, but I look at financial stress and anxiety as as a, as a big component of anxiety. And I often see it in my clients, um, especially now with inflation and, and sometimes people having to worry about their jobs or they're not getting the raises that are deserved and people having to deal with this. And so I, I think that there is a lot of anxiety when it comes to thinking about money. And I think that the idea and what Bitcoin represents, hopefully can give people a little bit more peace of mind with that. You mentioned that your husband has been in the Bitcoin space for quite a while. In the beginning, when he became so actively involved and you were busy building up your business and raising your kids, what did you think about Bitcoin? You know, it's. I think I thought it was very I didn't, I don't even know what I thought. I thought it was strange. I thought, oh, is this a scam? Is this a, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I just didn't know what it was. I was just like, I don't really know, but I would listen and I would watch and we have a good relationship. So I trust him in terms of the things that he's pursuing and he's doing. So I listened and would watch things, but it it probably took a good, I said 13 years. It's probably been like 10 years where I was not really paying attention or involved and probably over, I I would say over the last three to five years, I've been more paying more attention and doing more um, self-study on my own. Okay. In your practice, you're seeing clients coming in with anxiety issues and a lot of it has to do with what's going on in the world today, financial stress, inflation, et cetera. How do you coach your clients in dealing with what they cannot change? I I think with anxiety, right? Like when something is really threatening to us that it's either fight, flight, or freeze. Sometimes we're just like, oh, I don't know what this is. I don't know what to do. And we just freeze because we don't know how to handle it. Sometimes 
we stick our head in the sand. I don't want to look. I don't want to know. I don't want to think about it. But the best thing that we can do is to face it and to deal with it. So part of it is getting my clients to actually look at what the problem is and to try to best prepare and how to best protect themselves and utilize resources that they have, maybe ask for supports if needed, being willing to sacrifice. Like sometimes you have to let some things go in order to move forward. So all of that, I think, is part of dealing with that anxiety to actually to look and to pay attention and to gather information that's going to help you to move forward and face whatever it is that you have to face. And and also to recognize that there may be some sacrifices that you have to make in that process. You may have to let some things go that you don't necessarily want to let go of. Okay. So let's say, hypothetically, I am a retiree. And I Mm -hmm. have whatever retirement income I have, social security or some kind of private something. And I'm watching the purchasing power of the same amount of money I'm receiving every month go down. And I'm filled with anxiety because I'm afraid there's going to come a day when I'm not going to have enough. And there's nothing for me to fall back on. How do you coach someone in that state? I'm trying to visualize how they can work through that and help Mm -hmm. themselves from your point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that from a professional standpoint, first, of course, is acknowledging sort of the, the challenges of that and then trying to put supports and Again, like letting some things go like that, that you're going to have to to make some changes. You're going to have to adjust. You're not going to be able to be living exactly as you were living. And so trying to figure out, okay, what are the priorities? What are the things that I can let go of? And then what are also, are there other places that I can get supports? And I think that would be a way from a psychological perspective that I would work with them. Now, I can't professionally suggest Bitcoin (laughs) to people, but I think that's the interesting thing about Bitcoin, right? Is that it's a way for people to invest and also to secure some of the money that they have. I think uh, with enough time, yes, if you're talking about money that you need to use immediately, then it's risky because it is still very volatile. But I do know that, I don't know, I'm assuming, if I'm literally that person I just described, and I have spent my entire life with a certain set of expectations, I work hard, I put money away, I retire, and I live in Florida. You are talking about making changes, necessary changes in the face of what's happening in our system today, in our society today with inflation, etc. I think a lot of people would find it very difficult to change their picture of what retirement should look like. I know that my mom expected her retirement years to be a certain way. And if you're trying to tell her that she can't live in the house that she was planning to live out her life in, that's, you're forcing, you're almost forcing her to change her reality. So how do you coach somebody who's in that situation where they must change the way they see things or see what is absolutely necessary for themselves as so, as something different with a different set of, I don't even know, like parameters. And I think that the, that expectations are that that is a component of anxiety too. Is that it's like when we feel like we're not meeting our own expectations or the other or the expectations of others or the expectations of life, we get really anxious. Like we have this vision of how things should be, and it, it's not happening, and that creates a lot of anxiety. And so part of it is reevaluating things and trying to have realistic expectations for where we are right now. And a lot of times with anxiety, people are either thinking about past things or they're worrying about their future and they're bouncing back and forth. So you have to be more in the now and the present, okay? And what what is actually happening now and do a reality check and having realistic expectations, like those things that we wanted or we expected, they're not going to happen. And we have to be in the now. And another component of anxiety is uncertainty. So if we don't know what's going to happen 
we get really anxious. And particularly now in a world that's changing and everything is, we feel like the rug's been pulled out from under. It's very anxiety provoking time. And there's a lot of uncertainty, but uncertainty doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. It can be exciting. It can also be good. And anxiety leads people to be also more pessimistic or negative. So trying to look for the good things or look for the things that are are positive is really important. But I think you're right. It's very hard to change those expectations or those things or the ways that we think that life is supposed to be is very difficult because when we are coming out of that, there's also grief. Like it's sad. It's sad that we had invested in so much and we had wanted so much or we expect, and then these things aren't going to happen. And so sometimes people are hit with grief on top of that. So it's very challenging. Yeah. That grief component, that was the word that I wasn't able to actually pin down, but that's absolutely true. I think for a lot of people, there is grief in the financial situation they find themselves today. So we Bitcoiners like to say that Bitcoin is hope and the hope means that it's in the future. So how do you balance that? If you live in the now, in today's reality, Bitcoin is still a very volatile asset class. It's not yet the money standard that we hope it to be. Mm-hmm. And yet, if we live in the present, I'm just trying to think of, um, can you give some practical tips for people who are feeling anxious about what's happening and coping with it today? without Mm -hmm. necessarily looking in the future to Bitcoin as hope. Yeah, I think that this is is the time of sacrifice, that that a lot of times, again, when we're we're about to make a change, there's things that we have to give up, we have to sacrifice, and it's hard. And again, doing a reality check of this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This will be a hard time. It's temporary. But I may need to cut back on things. I may need to utilize the resources that I do have, checking the resources you do have and trying to utilize what you have right now. And then the other piece of it in order to change is we have to take risks and we have to be willing to take a risk. And so there is a risk in investing in in something like Bitcoin. It may be scary for a lot of people because it's not something that's familiar or known. It's something that there's a lot of naysayers out there about it. You're, you may be doing things differently than your family or your friends are. But in order to change, again, sometimes we have to sacrifice things and we have to take a little bit of a risk in order to move, in order for things to be different. And when we're going to move into something, we can either jump in with both feet. Yeah, I'm going to go all in. Or the other thing you can do is you can, it can be gradual change. So maybe you like, okay, well, I'm just going to invest a little bit and I'm going to watch and I'm going to see how that goes. And then you feel a little bit more comfortable and you're talking to more people or you're seeing, and maybe you're like, you're watching things change. Like you're seeing new businesses open in, in terms of taking Bitcoin or you're seeing another country. Okay. Okay. This is moving. It's there's things happening. It's growing that, and that gives you a little bit more confidence. Okay. Maybe I'll invest a little bit more. And that's going to help, I think, in terms of feeling hope also in seeing that things are changing, that things are happening. You can even see it, I think, in the political spectrum, there are some candidates out there that are open to Bitcoin. I think that's pretty cool too. Uh, but that's that's part of the process of change. And I think circling back, you know, I, I always talk with clients about the impetus for change. What's the reason to do something? So for example, if somebody is going to, I don't know, try to lose weight or something like that. And what I find, and this is just my own way of thinking about it. I don't know if anybody else thinks it this way, but I I think that sometimes we do things either like for the love of ourselves. So it could be for vanity. So maybe like people just want to have money, or maybe it could be because I want to secure my own future or Or it could be the love of somebody else. Well, I want to do this for my kids. Or maybe because I saw somebody else do it and they had benefits to it. Um, So it's either the love of self or the love of others, or there's a crisis. So sometimes like a crisis is an impetus for change. Like, oh, wow, I lost all of my my other investments. So I'm going to try 
Bitcoin now, like that's, or the government took all my money. So I'm going to, I want to find a, a secure way to invest. There's a crisis that happens and that will be the impetus for change. But for some people, even a crisis isn't going to be an impetus for change. So it's like somebody who's a smoker and they're on, they got emphysema and they're on the machine and they're still smoking and they're really sick, but they're still going to keep doing it. So there's going to be some people that don't necessarily buy into it. And then I think, so there's the impetus for change. Like, why am I doing this? What What's important to me? And then there's the process of change. And at first, we may not even know we need to change or do anything differently. And then we may be like, oh, I, I need to do something differently in terms of my investments. And so you start, you're sitting on the fence and you're gathering information. And so maybe it is, you're listening to podcasts. Maybe you're talking to somebody who's already invested in Bitcoin, or you go to a meetup group. And then when you have enough information and you feel comfortable, then you make a move. So you may decide, okay, I'm going to invest a little bit on it. And so you you gradually get into it. So I think there is a, a process for change and, and it can either be gradual or again, you can jump in with both feet. The change is also hard and there's a lot of resistance to it. Most people don't like to change because as I said, there's a sacrifice. So it's time. Okay. I have to invest this time in learning about this, or I'm going to have to move money over to invest in Bitcoin. And again, it's scary and I'm doing it differently than other people and people may judge me for it. And so trying to get out of our own way in, in terms of thinking about, okay, what are the roadblocks are important and to have some confidence and, and, and just takes and be willing to take a little bit of a risk is important. And I, I think like the other thing like I, I think about too is that particularly for women, and which this is why I'm so glad that you're doing this podcast, is that money and economics are just so important because when we're financially sound, we feel safe, we feel secure, we feel empowered, we feel like we have control and we have more freedom and autonomy. And that's why being financially sound and knowledgeable is just so important, especially for women. And because I see in my practice, women who maybe are single and they just don't really focus on these kinds of things or women who are not in good partnerships, and then they get compromised or hobbled with not being knowledgeable about these things, or they get stuck or they lose their own sense of power in the relationship. And so I think it really is important for women to look and to learn and to face these issues, which I'm on the cusp of doing myself. <laughs> Great. I'm grateful. I have a good partner who shares everything with me. He, he, we talk about it and he's, this is ours and it just it is very good. But for some women, that's not the case and they end up getting stuck or they're in a very poor financial situation. And this is why it's so important for women to learn about these things. Like I, I had a, a friend who was telling me a story about a woman that she knew who, and she didn't, my friend doesn't know a lot about Bitcoin. And I was talking to her a little bit about what I knew. And she was telling me about this other woman who discovered that her husband, and she was the, the breadwinner of the family, actually, but she trusted her husband and he took a lot of money out of her savings. And he said that he got scammed by Bitcoin, but he wanted a divorce. And I said, that's really weird. Like, I was like, I don't understand how he could be scammed by Bitcoin. And then it hit me. I was like, he took that money and invested in Bitcoin. So she couldn't get it. And this is what my hypothesis is. I don't know if it's true or not, but this woman had no awareness that is something that could even be possible. And, and so she believed that she was being scammed, but no, he actually stole her money. And this kind of stealing of money whether it's in a relationship or whether it's government or whatever it is, I, I think as women, we need to be, again, aware of our finances and, and Bitcoin's a great way to have some security. And I, I guess they, these are just things that I think about. Yeah, I homeschooled and Scott and I, from the very beginning, felt like we were exceptionally unprepared for real life, even though we both graduated from brand name schools because we didn't know the fundamentals of what you just mentioned. We knew how to ha have a checking account. This is decades ago, of course. 
we knew how to balance our checkbooks. You don't have to do that today, but、uh, we knew how to balance our checkbooks. We knew that you could put money in the mutual fund in the stock market itself, but we didn't really understand how money worked. And like you、mm-hmm. said, in a healthy household, we divide and conquer, right? We have women generally would take care of the house, and men generally would work and take care of the finances. But like you said, things change and. You don't necessarily have to be in a healthy relationship to be in a, a situation where you need to know this stuff. And so, I wish that schools today would prepare our young people for the realities of life, like those things, like the really super practical stuff, instead of studying a bunch of things that are philosophical and conceptual. I understand why we need to study history, but if I had to choose one to learn how money works versus Memorizing a bunch of dates and wars and names of kings and queens and generals, I would rather they learn the practicalities of what money is and how to take care of it throughout their lifetime. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it also it just it it helps to prepare. Like if there's again, if there's a crisis or if there's an unexpected, you need to know what what to do and how to and just to protect yourself. It's the best way to protect yourself. And as you said, oftentimes we're, we're not really educated. And even as a psychologist, I, there were no business classes in terms of running a business as a psychologist. I mean, these are all things I had to learn and I had to figure it out. And better for it, I still don't like it. <laughs> like it's not my, it's not my favorite. It's not my go-to. I just, I really like working with people. And but I think it's important. It's. It, because it does provide us with all those things like safety, security, control, freedom, autonomy. Yeah, it's very important. I also found it really interesting that you mentioned when you and your husband were running your two separate businesses, you felt the pain of the money going out of your account running a business because you see it. Running a business is such a emotional roller coaster, and You're solely responsible. You have no safety net. You are it. How your business does, how much money comes in every month, you are it. And then to see it so casually taken out of your account, either through taxes or fees or whatever、uh, license or local, I don't even know what to call those things. Like there are so many requirements that fall under fees that you have to pay on top of. Uh, yes. Income tax and all of that stuff.、Uh, like you really feel the pain of that going out versus somebody who's getting a paycheck where everything has already been, been taken out. So they don't get to, they don't get to see that part. They just see what they take home, and they feel the pain a little bit less. I definitely am experiencing that now. Scott and I running our own business, our first time in our lives, because he, for his whole career, was corporate. And I love this analogy. Somebody said, "If your income is visible and physical and sitting in a wagon outside your house, this is your harvest, and you see how much is taken out of that wagon, or how little you get to keep yourself, you get angry." But we don't get yeah, to see that. Yeah, it's infuriating. I agree with you. It's infuriating, and I find it, it's very interesting because I have a, a lot of friends that that either they or their husbands work in. In corporate or government jobs, and lovely people, but not really seeing those effects. And I, I look at people who are really struggling, and I, I think that when you work in those kinds of environments, you don't have that same level of awareness as the person who I don't know owns the restaurant, or it's just a very different experience, and. It, it, it's it is anxiety provoking. Also, what's going on right now in terms of just our economy? It just is. It just is. But yeah, would you be okay with us talking about maybe some of the kids that you see in terms of what they feel anxious about? Because I feel like there's an epidemic of anxious children these days. Yeah, I work less with younger kids nowadays. I do see a couple of. Adolescents and a few college students, and they're worried about jobs, and they're worried about whether or not that they can own a house. And a lot of them, at least in the area that I live in, their parents are very well 
to do and they want to be able to have the same things that their parents had, but don't think that they're going to be able to get it. And they're worried about student debt, student loans. And I, I don't think they're prepared. I don't think that they're prepared. And so I think having kids and adolescents and college students learn about Bitcoin, I think is really important. It's a balancing act between depressing them too much right. and giving them hope. So depressing them right. about what's happening today and the yeah. hope in Bitcoin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about how Bitcoin has affected you personally in a practical way. So I know that as a whole family, you guys have been in the Bitcoin space for a while. But for yourself, you mentioned that you started paying attention only three to five years ago. So since you started paying attention, how has it changed the way you maybe live practically or just in the way that you view life in general? I, I think it's an ongoing process, right? Because I think you get used to also living a certain way and, and also relying on what is the norm. But as I said, I see hope in that just in looking at more, it's very simple, but I think just seeing businesses being open to Bitcoin, seeing bank machines with Bitcoin, seeing again, some candidates that are very supportive of Bitcoin, I think is important and seeing just on the world stage that other countries are beginning to use it. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. I still, in my mind, I'm like, how is all this going to work? But it's still, but yeah, so it's neat. And in reality, it has been a roller coaster, but I think that's okay too. That's also how life is. It's not always stable, but I think it's positive because it's growth. And I think when we see what's happening to our traditional money situation with all the debt that countries have and the spending that's going on that I think it's a great safety net. And you mentioned that you have children. How are you and your husband transferring your Bitcoin knowledge to them? Are they open to it? They're teenagers. <laughs> Are teenagers and sometimes kids aren't always in line with what their parents are. They, they listen. I think they're interested, but they also make fun of us uh, as well too. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, Bitcoin. But then they're really curious. They, they are like, how much Bitcoin do you have? We're, like, We're not going to tell you. We don't need to talk about that. So I think there, there's a curiosity there, but they're waiting to see. And I think it will be my two, actually all of my kids, including my my youngest had a job at 14 for a while. And so they're also learning about money. And so they're having to, you know, they're already complaining about, I don't want to have to pay taxes. And there's some anxiety, I think, or worry they have about money as well. And so we're trying to educate them and talking about spending, saving and investing in different ways to do that, including Bitcoin. I think that's part of our job as parents to try to help them to be financially sound and responsible. What about the rest of your family? Are you able to share Bitcoin with them? Big sigh. <laughs> we have not been successful at, I don't think anyway, in terms of having family adopt Bitcoin. It, we have not. I know what I would say is my sister, I think, regrets not investing earlier. She may have been, I haven't really talked with her about it. I know she has some friends that have invested in it. So she may at this point have invested somewhat in it, but it's, I think it's a big change for people. It's very different and it's hard for people to go to do things differently, but that's growth. When you can really go against the norm, that's courageous. You no. Know? And, and it's exciting. So Okay, so let's do psychoanalysis. When we talk to people who are in a position where the monetary system hasn't disappointed them, it's worked out for them, mm -hmm. and their identity is wrapped up in the result of their effort that have worked out for them, how do we talk to them about Bitcoin without attacking their identity that's wrapped up in all of that? That's a really good question. 
That's a really good question. I think that messaging is like, in, in order also to get other people to change, a lot of times we have to repeat the message in several different ways at different times before people are willing to hear it. You know what I mean? Also, just because we voice things, again, it offers an impetus for change, but it's not a guarantee. You can try to educate people, but it may not be, I don't know, it may not be worth it for them to change. You know what I mean? Maybe, and then that circles back to what's the impetus for change? What would be the reason for them to change? And it may not be possible for some people unless you can find what would really motivate them. Like maybe for some people it might be, well, you could actually lose less money or you make more money or whatever. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's, well, it's going to benefit you in this way. Or maybe they see that it's been uh, beneficial to you. Maybe that would be that they're like, oh, okay, maybe I'll try that. It's hard to know what is going to cause people to other people to change, or maybe it's the, their own crisis. I think and that all you can really do is you can try to talk about it, but but some people, they're not going to care. Everybody has their things that they prioritize or that is important to them. And it, it, so I, I don't think, I can't even think of what the magic would be that would get somebody to, to be interested in or to get it. I don't know. And, and maybe it would take just more people doing it where it becomes more of a norm and people are like, oh, okay, this is happening. So I'll invest now as it becomes more of a norm, because I think it, it is really hard for people to do things differently than what other people are to be more independent or it's, it's not an easy thing to do because you get judged. That is so true. <laughs> okay. Any last recommendations to women who are still sitting on the fence about Bitcoin? I think it's just continue to talk to people and learn about it and consider making a little bit of a sacrifice, whether it's that time of learning about it or investing a little bit of money and just seeing what it's like. What does it feel like just to have a little bit of Bitcoin? Maybe that will feel good. Maybe it'll reassure you. Maybe you'll find it fun watching it go up and seeing things open up. There you go. There's another store that's accepting Bitcoin. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. That was really fun. I really enjoyed your professional diagnosis. Thank you. <laughs> On the psychology and, and, and of change. It's like watching. A, it is. It's exciting. Like it's very. And this is one last thing I want to say with just all the craziness that's going on right now and just the inflation. And it's so horrible. It's just horrible and stressful. But the idea of something new and something different working is really exciting. It's really because we need something new because it's not working right now. And I think that's exciting. That's very exciting. So thank you so much, Tally. It was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode. Did you enjoy it? Wasn't our guest absolutely fabulous? I just love every woman's story on this show. Everybody has a unique perspective, and yet we all come to the same place, which is Bitcoin is an important part of our lives. If this story has inspired you and you would like to know more, go to www.orangechatter.com. Get involved, join our reading group, send me an email and introduce yourself. I would be so happy to hear from you. The best way you can support this show is to spread the word. Tell every woman you know to listen in. You never know how they will be impacted by these stories. I appreciate you so much. See you next time. Bye. This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids.